and it is because of our efforts toward getting straight to the root that people oftentimes think we are dealing in hate. Um, so just getting us started, um, is there anything that you feel that I should know before we start? Uh, anything I feel you should know? Um, no, I, I, I'm going to assume you being a student at Stanford um, with your grandfather um, being one of your uh, primary mentors that, um, you know, you're a pretty solid, sound, um, young student. Thank you. Perfect. So we can just get started with the first question. Um, so um, one thing that you mentioned a lot is that you had a very well-rounded education um, and that really influenced the way that you saw the world. Can you tell me more about some of the topics that you were taught growing up? Well, my mother was a, a young woman when she was with her husband, mm -hmm. right? Um, and, you know, I write about different stages of this in various books that I've written, right? And Betty Before X and Growing Up X. And as a young woman, a young wife, the mother of four babies, toddlers, and pregnant with twins, she experienced her home being firebombed mm -hmm. as she lay in the bed with her husband. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I often just think about what was that like for her? Fortunately, she grew up with a lot of faith mm -hmm. in the AME church, you know, with her, her family who her father was a deacon, her, her, her adopted father was a deacon. You know, her mother was the Sunday school teacher, both graduates of Tuskegee um, Institute. Mm -hmm. And having instilled specific values in her, she, she learned about marching, protesting, demonstrating, right? She grew up in a segregated community that was very much a community. Mm -hmm. um, she was a part of the Housewives League, the Detroit Housewives League, which was um very effective in ensuring that our nation um hire black in the meatpacking industry because it was a, a a billion dollar industry and so their uh um for lack of a better word their motto was basically if you want our money then our then our husbands and our children and our families are worthy of being employed, mm -hmm. right? And so with my mother having been raised in that kind of environment, you know, with lots of love, um, with lots of responsibility, um, really intimate, warm, interactive community, mm -hmm. thank goodness my father chose her as his wife, mm -hmm. right? Thank goodness my mother accepted him as her husband. Mm -hmm. And so to have experienced this firebombing of her home. She was just in her 20s, her late 20s, and her husband was in his 30s. And then one week later, having witnessed, you know, the assassination of her husband, what she taught her six daughters is to never accept no or I can't as an answer for ourselves. And she focused on our identity right? So that we could be sound minded individuals prepared to, to navigate through society's ills. Mm -hmm. And it was a home filled with an overabundance of love and, and support, right? Because our art, our books, um, all of these things in our household underscored our ability to thrive. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Thanks for sharing. Um, and how do you feel like your education like um, impacted the way that you approach teaching and educating other people in general too? So funny, I remember one of the subjects that I just would find myself really um, like 
thinking of other things as opposed to listening to my professor mm -hmm. or my instructor, you know, was American history. And I just remember just not being into it at all. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I loved math. I loved art. Mm -hmm. I loved English. I loved French. But for some reason, history just didn't do it for me and I didn't pay attention. Mm -hmm. It's the same thing with economics, right? And it's because I didn't understand it. And no matter what, you know, each of my teachers would get up and, and teach, I just found myself just not interested in those subjects. Mm -hmm. and, and so what I remember, um, you know, I could say when I was in high school mentoring um, young children, um, in a group home setting, mm -hmm. why I became passionate about teaching. I can, I can say that when I went to college and found myself again in another kind of lockup facility situation of a group home, mm -hmm. you know, recognizing the emptiness mm -hmm. of a lot of these young children mm -hmm. really um, touched me. And, and, and what I came to understand when I became a substitute teacher immediately after graduating from college was for the first time being in a public school and seeing that the students didn't have books, didn't have papers, didn't have a regimen, didn't, you know, and I was supposed to just go in and basically babysit. And so instead I decided you know, I was, I was, um, I was gonna say babysitting. I was teaching a um, English literature class. Mm -hmm. It was in you know, substitute. Yeah. And so they were supposed to learn how to write and they were supposed to be the worst, you know, level of young people in the high school. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it was, who's your favorite music musician, right? And they would all like raise their hand and say, so I would write names on the board. Who, you know, if you, um, if someone said, I'm going to give you all the money you want, how much money would it be? They would say all these different denominations. And, and if there's something that you could do, you could go, you could be, what would that be? And I would write their answers down. So I said, now let's write, put this in a form of an essay, right? So, you know, understanding that you have to stimulate the learning environment with information that your students can identify, right? So if I learned about economics from a standpoint of when I, you know, get a job, I should know how to spend my money. I should know what the stock market, you know, is, you know, all of these different things, right? Or if in history, you know, I'm learning about um, the truth about Egypt, right? That these were, this was a, 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 a country in, on the African continent, right? right? Mm -hmm. If I learned the truth about um, Mali, the empire of Mali, where, you know, the first school, the first university was created and that people of, you know, the ancient world would travel to Mali to have degrees conferred to them, mm -hmm. you know, from scholars, right? If I understood that the cradle of humanity, the cradle of thriving civilizations was in Africa, then I could possibly then understand the present complexities, mm -hmm. right? From slavery, from all the things that, that have happened, you know, consequently, right? That have, that have happened. Mm -hmm. And so for me, it was important to have information, historical information that the class could understand and then, you know, they could identify with the characters right. and then, you know, therefore learn. And much like um, Lemuel, I can't think of his full name. He was just at the Shabbat Center. The gentleman who wrote Hamilton, the production, the musical production, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. What he did is he took a part of history where we could care, we didn't know much about mm -hmm. Alexander Hamilton, the 1700s. We can't even identify with these people, right? Mm -hmm. But what he did is he took this historical information and he made it relevant mm 
to young people. And he had us see these historical characters, you know, these activists, these individuals who wrote the constitution and he humanized them. So I think um, when I was able to just kind of have a light bulb moment that this could be a way to teach because this is how I was taught when I was, you know, a child in my home, you know, learning about um, historical figures, learning about history and just having story time. And it just so happened to be that the content was true and it also involved people who looked like me and it, and, and, and it further encouraged, you know, my um, progress and, and productivity and, and, and learning and, you know, all of those great things. Yeah, yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. And like, I also didn't really get a full history. Even right now, I'm still like learning and being like, wow, I can't believe that ever happened. And I just never, just never learned about it. Well, it's intentional and it's it's unfortunate, but it is intentional. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's why it is important to become critical thinkers, right? And, and that is the reason why, um, you know, during the height of a pandemic, while we're forced, you know, and self-isolating, right, to watch this horrific um, killing of an, an innocent man, mm -hmm. right, um, nine minutes and 26 seconds, and people, you know, in an uproar and, in, and, and outraged. Mm -hmm. and, and in spite of the pandemic, going out and marching in 50 states in this country and 18 countries abroad, demanding that Black Lives Matter, right? Mm -hmm. Where before they just didn't understand, you know, when we said, hey, you know, get your, your boot off of my neck, you know, hey, slavery, you know, all of these different systemic injustices that people simply refuse to accept. But now we understand and now we are trying to make change. And, and it's great that young people are recognizing that those in power have misused power and demanding change. And they're demanding that this kind of information is included in their education curriculum. Right, right. Yeah, and then on that note, um, so what do you feel like the best way is to make sure that everybody gets their like full and real histories? Do you feel like it's better to do like an ethnic studies type class um, or do, yeah, a policy? Like, what are your thoughts? Well, I think it's really important to make sure that in our education curriculum, that it is accurate and that is based on historical facts. We can't have white people portraying King Tut or Cleopatra, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Just like we can't have black people portraying George Washington or Abraham Lincoln, right? Mm -hmm. And you know, it's just a matter of being honest and 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 you know, so that you know we have an education curriculum in our country that says African American history is American history. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. And I had something that I had written and that Native American history and and Asian history, but all of these histories where people were you know, like the Japanese internment. Right. All of the histories and the accounts that happened in this country is a part of American history. American history can't be one sided. Right. The indigenous people who were already here. That should be included, you know, from an accurate perspective, right? So that we understand what slavery really was, right? That they weren't simply slaves, but that they were enslaved human beings, enslaved, refined, and industrious African people, mm -hmm. enslaved Black, indigenous people of color, right? From this country. And that when we understand the importance of controlling the narrative, then instead of just reducing, you know, these people to just slaves, that we say that, you know, here were these people held against their will, terrorized generation upon generation, and yet 
they made such a significant contribution to our society, to our culture. Mm -hmm. And had it not been for them, that we today would not have the opportunity of claiming the United States of America, our home. And so we owe it to you know, those who were held against their will. I think that's extremely important. And, and, and I think that's what happens you know, when we control the narrative and we, we look at the subsequent massacres of the Black Wall Street in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and in um, Rosewood, Florida, you know, and if these kinds of incidents are taught in our classes to be as American as the Boston Tea Party, then we understand, you know, the, you know, the historical truths, right? Mm -hmm. and, and, and the necessity for reparations. And we have an opportunity to ensure that we're instilling a value system of truth, honesty, and human compassion versus racism, discrimination, hatred, right? Because when we teach young people hate, and especially to hate others, in essence, we're teaching them how to hate themselves, right? And so one of the things that I'm really grateful for with my mother is that she focused on all of the things that in, encouraged self-love in our home. We had this beautiful wooden statue from Haiti, which was a, a, a woman in a walking stance with a basket on her head and a child in her hand. Mm -hmm. and, and to me, I just remember always looking at the statue and thinking how beautiful she was mm -hmm. and just seeing so much possibility, right? And duality. I mean, here she is working, she's walking, she's moving forward, and she's a mother, mm -hmm. you know? So that just said so much to me. And I just remember always looking at that statue and the books that we had and our art that decorated our homes. And, you know, there's, there was an artist, Tom Feelings of a, of a boy, you know, beautiful boy with overalls in the country, you know, just all kinds of things, but it was just wonderful um, art that was a reflection of who we are. I think that's so important because this is also during the time when, you know, most black homes had pictures of, um, you know, of, of people that just did not look like them. And so it, what it does is, you know, it says that you can't have pride in yourself. Mm -hmm. and, and the last thing I'll say is even with the doll, the um, identical dolls, mm -hmm. the research study showed that children, you know, really young children, four, five, six, seven years old, were choosing white dolls over black dolls, but the dolls were identical. Mm -hmm. And they were saying that the, the black doll was dirty, ugly, mean, poor, and the white doll was good, happy, smart. And, you know, that again speaks to systemic racism, right? Mm -hmm. The messages that we're giving our children, right? And, and, and how unfortunate when a child is that young and realizes that the doll that they are, that they're selecting, mm -hmm. that they want to play with is, is a doll that doesn't look like them because the doll that looks like them is bad, mm -hmm. you know? And, and so that's just, you know, something that would affect me. And I would want to offer you know, some kinds of solutions. And so it's why I do the work that I do, why I've written books and why I'm a college professor. Yeah, that's amazing. I know it's a long, long reply. <laughs> no. Fill up our hour. <laughs> um, I was just gonna ask like, um, so like in the face of Black Lives Matter and Stop Asian Hate, I know that for me and my friends, it's been really challenging to like, process all the emotions that have been brought up. Um, and so how do you process and channel like the sense of like anger, sadness, helplessness um, that occurs in the face of injustices? Well, oh, that's, yeah, that, that, that's not easy. How do I process? You know, I enjoy my students mm -hmm. and I want them to process, right? I want them to, um, have the capacity to see, not from a black and white perspective, but from a perspective of right and wrong, right? So we aren't the victims and, you know, but that we understand 
what this is and that we understand if we want change that we have to you know be willing to call you know the injustices out and make change mm -hmm. and and again you know it, that's why i was so proud of what young people did this summer you know simply by organizing right and protesting and and you know that that this message led by young people was ignited in 50 in 50 states in this country mm -hmm. right that never happened before of black white red yellow green blue purple all kinds of people different backgrounds different thoughts just you know proclaiming that black life matters mm -hmm. right that you know this isn't a case of anything else but injustice against these lives and we recognize it and we're not going to tolerate it we're not going to accept it mm -hmm. i you know was just um so inspired and i not just i was inspired i mean clearly the world was inspired it was in 18 countries abroad so it speaks to the power of young people right it speaks to the power and, and i think it's really important because it was in the 1950s i think it was carter g woodson who said the biggest race is to see who will control the minds of young people. So mm -hmm. it's young people not being distracted by video games and, and all of these things that have, you know, that don't matter, you know, that won't make a difference in your life, you know, later and, you know, as you grow older, but recognizing the power that you have to be educated, to understand your, your self-worth, you know, your value, and, um, you know, again, the importance of self-love yeah that's amazing and not depending on others you know on others opinion of you to define you right right and so just kind of following up on that like do you have any general advice for teachers students or young activists who are listening in i do let me see i because i wrote this is probably from that article that i had written Sounds good. Thank you over here um the omission of Black, Indigenous, Brown, Asian, and Latinx history is not incidental. These exclusions distance people from their own heritage, their own lineage, and ultimately their own sense of self. A whitewashed curriculum enforces the myth that there have never been scholars, thinkers, innovators, caregivers, iconoclasts, artists, and revolutionaries across these various identities. Consider, for example, the ancient African, African kingdoms that were full of immense progress, scholarship, and knowledge. If we learned about them in the same way we learned about ancient Greece and Rome, we would appreciate the present complexity of Black civilization and negate the teachings of biases and inherited hate and, and all the things that you know, come as a result of that. Mm -hmm. So I think it's just absolutely so important. There's lots of history out there. All we have to do is just learn it, mm -hmm. right? right? We learn how to do so many other things. We learn how to knit, we learn how to cook, we learn how to dance, we learn how to sing, we learn how to use the internet, right? All we have to do is learn historical facts and use those, um, those, that information when we're teaching, you know, so that all the students in the class understand that they've made, you know, they come from a, a lineage of those who made significant contributions, right? And there's so much that we can do. I think it's extremely important that we learn to love who we are so we do not um, rely on others to determine our own self-worth. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, thanks so much for your time. Okay, we finished? Yes. Awesome. <laughs> Thank you so much.